Well, good morning, members and guests. Welcome to the second uh, Budget Review Subcommittee on Economic Development, Tourism, and Environmental Protection. We are waiting for a few members to have a quorum, um, but before we do that, I want to ask the Secretary to take roll, please. Senator McGarvey. Here. Senator Schroeder. Here. Senator Smith. Representative Gentry. Here. Representative Hale. Representative Kolkarni. Representative Maddox. Representative Rowland, Senator McDaniel, Here. Representative Weber, Present. Senator Caslin. Here. Okay, um, so we're going to get started with our meeting, and if we do have enough members come in for a quorum, we'll probably stop for just a second and probably try to approve the minutes from the last meeting. But at this time, uh, we're going to have a presentation by the Paramutual Wagering License and Taxation Group. If you all want to make your way to the table and then announce yourself for the record, we're going to turn the floor over to you all for a presentation. Thank you. Okay, we'll let you all announce yourself and we'll go from there. Hi, good morning. I'm Jamie Eads, the Interim Executive Director for the Taxation Commission. Jamie Eads, Interim Executive Director for the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission. Good morning. Right, good morning. Sean Detta, Deputy General Counsel for the Racing Commission. Wakasa, I'm a Director of Parimutuel Wagering and Compliance for the KHRC. Well, welcome to the meeting. Well, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, we, uh, we will be presenting on the historic uh, changes to the paramutual tax code that went into effect uh, August 1, 2022. We want to preface this presentation by saying that the paramutual tax code, just like uh, any other, is a very uh, complicated one and there are lots of caveats and hidden things here and there. Uh, but today our uh, hope is to summarize the major changes and uh, take questions at the end for any uh, details that you guys uh, might need. So without further ado, so first and foremost, the Kentucky Horse Racing Commission is an independent regulatory body of the Commonwealth and is tied to the Public Protection Cabinet for administrative purposes. The KHRC, like many other sister agencies across the U.S., oversees the licensure and conduct of racing and wagering in, the, in Kentucky. The KHRC may license up to nine racetracks, allow each license, uh, licensee to race horses of a certain breed, and conduct wagering on one of the methods shown on this slide. As you can see, there are four main types of paramutual wagering. What we refer to as live wagers uh, occurs uh, in real time at the racetrack. Simulcast wagering occurs when you go to a track to bet on another racetrack's races, whether in-state or out-of-state. Uh, historical horse racing occurs at a licensee's approved location and is basically a wager on races previously run. Finally, ADW, or Advanced Deposit Account Wagering, are wagers on any horse race, and this ability is granted to an operator that applies for a separate type of license annually. As of July, we have nine licensed racetracks, two of which are in, planning, uh, in construction or uh, planning phases. We have 11 locations for someone to participate in uh, simulcasting, uh, many of uh, these locations are just racetracks or their extension locations. We have 10 total locations that will be offering historical horse racing at the end of this month. As a rule of thumb, each licensee can have up to two historical horse racing facilities. Um, and last but not least, we have eight ADW operators. So before I go into the tax rates, it's important to see the number of wagers and the volume of bets that uh, are subject to the parimutuel tax. A very important note here is that these uh, numbers shown at the top here are gross amounts bet, and these figures do not mean that the operators offering this type of wagering get to retain 100% of these amounts. Uh, in fact, on average, live uh, wagering on live races yields about 20% in takeout or commission, and historical horse racing averages around 8.5 to 9%. We've come a long way from where we were 10 years ago. We did not have historical horse racing or even ADW. 
in uh, 20, uh, 2011, 2012. As you can see, historical horse racing and ADW uh, comprise the majority of our wagers, uh, and, and then it's followed by live and uh, simulcast wagering. In total, the general fund, uh, as you can see on the bottom, I've summarized the tax receipts. The general fund uh, received four, over $49 million in fiscal year 2022 uh, from uh, tax receipts. So on this page, we've got uh, the previous tax rates and the new ones. Uh, the previous tax rate uh, varied from 0.5% to 3.5%, three, uh, three uh, depending on the type of track running the uh, races as well as uh, the level of uh, wagers that they were getting. The overall uh, rate for simulcast uh, decreased to 1.5%. Previously, it was 3%. And advanced deposit account wagering went from 0.5% to 1.5%. On the right, we've got a list of the restricted funds that uh, benefit from the distributions uh, of the tax. Uh, the biggest fund to receive, uh, the biggest single single fund, would be the general fund, uh, which receives uh, roughly 48% of the uh, total receipts, and then the the remainder is uh, distributed to each of these funds that are listed here. So this page shows a detailed view of the new tax rates. Uh, for the sake of time, I've noted uh, the major changes on the next page, and we'll cover those in a second. But I do want to note that for general fund uh, in the columns of live and HHR, uh, if you go to the bottom, those are effective rates, and that is due to uh, certain caps that come into uh, play for uh, live racing as well as historical horse racing um, for, uh, for this uh, upcoming fiscal year. Um, once these caps are met, the general fund uh, is able to retain any uh, receipts that, uh, based off of the, the rate that was assigned to each of those caps. Um, due to, I do want to point out that due to how young historical horse racing is within uh, not only Kentucky but in the entire world, uh, and the fact that it makes 92% of our wagers, we're not able to figure, we, don't, we can't really project what's going to happen next month, let alone the next year. Uh, the growth has been exponential. So uh, just wanted to point that out there. So this slide has uh, some of the more important changes, uh, big picture items. Uh, the Kentucky Thoroughbred Development Fund, which previously did not have a cap, now has a $45 million cap for uh, deposits, all deposits within the fiscal year from live and historical horse racing at thoroughbred tracks. The Kentucky Standard Bread Development Fund will be capped at $20 million within a fiscal year from live racing, uh, and a separate $20 million cap exists for uh, historical horse racing at a harness track. The equine industry programs have been expanded to include the University of Kentucky and Bluegrass Community and Technical College, and this cap is uh, $1.5 million for a fiscal year. After this cap is met, the Breeders' Incentive Funds will receive $500,000 from historical horse racing at all tracks. Um, once the, uh, all of these caps are met, so the KTDF, the Thoroughbred Development Fund, once that cap is met, uh, any funds uh, beyond that uh, will go to the general fund at a, uh, or let me backtrack. So the rate, if I'm going to, let me go back here. Before the cap is met, the rate is 0.75% for the Thoroughbred Development Fund and 1% for the Kentucky Standard Bread Development Fund. When it is met, once the cap is met, that rate decreases to 0.4% of uh, wagers uh, distributed, and the remainder is retained by the general fund. The same sort of cap exists for, uh, uh, for the equine drug research, the higher education programs, breeders incentive, and the equine industry programs, once these caps are met, then the uh, general fund will start retaining the funds. And that's, uh, that's the reason for the effective tax rate uh, for the general fund at the bottom there. So this slide represents the estimated revenues from the excise tax going back to fiscal year 2018. I do want to note that these are rounded figures, and because of the uh, large volume of tax we're dealing with here, there might be, if we try to add up uh, all these columns, uh, there might be a couple hundred thousand dollars off. But for accurate uh, actual figures, I'd like to point you guys to the uh, Kentucky Horse Racing Commission website, which has... Uh, all, the, uh, all these details and more going back to fiscal year 2016. 
But basically, in fiscal year 2018, we had three historical horse racing sites. And the reason why I'm pinpointing historical horse racing is because that is the largest volume of bets that we get. And so in uh, fiscal year 2018, we had three sites. And you can see the uh, excise tax revenue that includes those sites as well as other forms of betting. In fiscal year 2022, we we had uh, six sites operating. And uh, the tax receipts uh, increased uh, about 400% from fiscal year 2018. The number of licensees and ADWs remain the same. In the last column, we see what the tax receipts may have looked like if we applied them to the handle from fiscal year 2022. So that's taking the new uh, tax rates from House Bill 607 and applying that to that year. Um, So this has been the bird's eye view of the tax. Um, We're happy to take any questions that you may have. Well, thank you all for the presentation. Do we have any members got any questions? Senator McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, guys, for being back around um, after the task force last interim. Just a quick clarification for those of us who aren't deep in this industry. The Thoroughbred Development Fund, that's what goes back into the purses to incentivize better horses to end up in the Commonwealth, correct? That is true. And, Jamie, do you want to? <clears throat> yes, it's a purse. All right. It's a um, purse supplemental program that Kentucky breds, so they have to be sired by a Kentucky stallion, fold here, and they can erase for additional purse money at our Kentucky racetracks. Gotcha. So start. So it's a it's a it's a start to finish um, incentive for the horse racing industry from from breeding to winning. Yes. All right. Very good. Thanks, guys. Okay. Senator Schroeder. Thank you. If you would go to that slide that um, references, I think it's the next slide maybe that you mentioned that. Um, Yes. Okay. So my understanding, it sounds like from your presentation, it's kind of a waterfall that we started starting at the top and is that's capped. If that hits the 45, then it drops down and then it drops down and then it drops down. Or am I understanding that wrong? That is correct. If you're referring to the $45 million, so when the $45 million cap is hit, um, that's when the rate will fall. But this KSDF is a uh, Kentucky Standard Bear Development Program. That is a separate cap and a separate sort of bucket. Okay. So that's only going to go into effect at harness tracks. And then the equine industry program is a separate rate. It's 0.2% of all historical horse racing wagers. So once this $1.5 million cap is met for the equine industry program, that 0.2% per, uh, percent of the deposits from that uh, will go to the Breeders' Incentive Fund, and then once that is met, uh, the remainder will go uh, to the general fund. Okay. Thank you. Well, it looks like that. Oh, Representative Gentry. Hi, folks. How are you this morning? <laughs> Uh, One quick question on the HHR licensees, operators. Do they all run live racing? Yes. So each licensee is required to conduct racing in order to have uh, the opportunity to have uh, historical horse racing. Okay. I knew the answer to that, but I thought colleagues here, because that's important. I've heard that come up a couple of times when we were working on the bill and have to make sure that you know the, the whole idea of HHR was really to protect our horse industry against the tremendous expansion of casino gaming that's been going on across the last couple of decades which has put a big impact in the horse racing industry so um, this was the number one answer um, for the horse racing industry and to protect that and especially the breeding industry since the breeding industry and the bourbon industry are huge signature industries to the state that we must protect and preserve. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was fully aware of that. Thanks. Absolutely. And uh, this slide right here actually just solidifies your point. If you can see the wage ring on live racing is $95 million by itself. Um, It would not exist if it did not have the revenues from 
historical horse racing, which is $6.8 billion. And the same can be said for our general fund and all the development funds that uh, Senator McDaniel was uh, alluding to earlier. I'm going to follow up on Representative Gentry's question just for clarification from my standpoint. So being from Owensboro, uh, they're currently uh, putting in an HHR facility in Owensboro and there isn't live racing. So how is it connected to another horse park or, or can y'all explain that and how that works? Yeah, the so Ellis Park in Henderson, Kentucky is the primary location, is the racetrack that has been given permission to open up the secondary facility in Owensboro. And it's in close proximity to, so Ellis Park is a thoroughbred racetrack that's been given the permission to have HHR at Owensboro. Okay, well, and I, I just want to kind of make that a little clearer as well because, uh, you know, it's roughly, um, you know, I mean, it's probably 40 plus miles uh, between the two cities and two completely separate cities. and. And so, you know, there isn't live horse racing there. Uh, even though Owensboro has deep roots in the thoroughbred, uh, we have a derby winner there uh, from about two miles down the road from where I live. Uh, but I, I did want to point that out because I think there's a lot of confusion uh, between people that are on both sides of the aisle with this on, on some of those locations starting to come up. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I have another question. I'm not really sure if it's for you or – uh, who I was, I was a little confused. Uh, the restricted fund equine drug research. So, what was that? This one. Yes. Okay. You just tell me a little bit about that. So I'm gonna pass it off to Jamie here. Sure. Um, the equine drug research is has been established since the tax rate began. Um, it is a group of, it's established by law and it's appointed by the governor um, and they get together periodically and allocate research dollars to um, different, you know, right now I think we've got one at the University of Kentucky that we're helping to fund. Um, its purpose is to sort of react to whatever's going on in the industry that might need research at the time. Um, we have an equine drug research council. We have a um, equine medical director that's paid for out of that fund. Okay. So is, are they issuing like, uh, will they, if I'm on the council, I'm voting, like we think the university of Kentucky has something promising here. Are they doing grants or are they getting some kind of like, is it seed funding or like, how's that? Um, if someone has a proposal, it would go to the council the members would consider it and then they might, uh, elect to, fund all of it, some of it, just depending on what the proposal is. It has a start and a conclusion, so it's not ongoing. Okay, but so if if they elect to fund the research, and let's just say this is a, ends up being a promising um, drug that the industry becomes widely used in the industry, uh, just like is the state benefiting from that, or the state just benefits from the the overall industry improving, but not it's not going to financially benefit. I'm just curious about that. Um, I think the research projects historically have been more about, um, you know, like breeding. Uh, some of the situations we've had in the past where we had um, mare loss or foal loss. Yeah. Um, I don't know that they've funded a particular drug. Okay. Um, I think it's more about keeping our breeding industry healthy. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. I got another question and just for clarification, because I know like you all said, there's so much that's changing and, you know, some of this law has only been in effect for 17 days roughly. So, uh, you know, I, I guess a lot of things to, to talk about here leading into the next session, but the ADW, uh, I wrote down, you said you all had eight license, um, or eight people that are, that are, I guess, participating in, in the ability to do that here in the state of Kentucky. And, is, I mean, are those the same folks that hold the license for the racetracks or like what kind of group of, of folks are those? Right. So the ADW wagers are, and I put a little phone on there. So it's basically mobile betting and uh, not necessarily racetracks. Um, it's uh, any, any kind of company that's developed the app or the means to uh, execute these uh, sort of wagers can come and apply there's no restriction on the number of licensees that can apply for an ADW wager. 
Um, but due to the capital involved in coming up with a sophisticated product that's going to succeed, uh, we only see a couple major players uh, within this market that continue to apply over and over. I live on a border community with Indiana, and so I think every other commercial on TV is Caesars about sports betting or something. And so I was just – I had never seen anything on the, uh, you know, the HHR from the ADW kind of show up. And so when I seen that, it was kind of something new, I guess, I was learning today. Oh, it's, we, they're not able to offer historical horse racing on ADWs. This would be live races only. Um, historical horse racing can only be or, uh, offered at brick and mortar per the statute. Senator McDaniels. Mr. Chairman, I can tell you somebody just got back from Massachusetts for a couple trips recently. Don't worry, we do anything with marijuana and you'll see more of those than you will anything related to historical horse racing, I can promise you. All right, well, I think that concludes the questions. Uh, thank you all for the presentation. And uh, I know it was pretty early on to ask you guys to come <clears throat> present, but we thank you for the information you presented us. At this time, we're gonna invite the Cabinet for Economic Development uh, to the table and, and um, Secretary Noll and, <clears throat> and uh, Commissioner Smith, if you all wanna come up and announce yourself for the record, we'll turn the floor to you all. Thank you. Senator, thank you very much. My name is Jeff Noel, and I'm very pleased to be the new Cabinet Secretary for Economic Development. I grew up in Kentucky and been for the last 28 years living in Michigan, working for Whirlpool Corporation. But I might say that every time anything came on about horse racing, my wife, who's from Union County, started nibbling in my ear saying it's time to get back to Kentucky. So there's a lot of interdependencies when you have, you know, promoting the, the heritages of Kentucky and uh, bringing people back to this great state. So for me, it's a great pleasure to be back here and it's a pleasure to have Katie join me for our presentation today. Good morning, Katie Smith, Deputy Secretary and Commissioner at the Cabinet. What I'd like to try to do is give a high level overview of, of the Cabinet's operations, including even some of our values and mission. Uh, get into a little bit more of the programs and then obviously uh, Katie's gonna walk through the specific line items in our budget, obviously, as our Deputy Secretary. I like to also refer to her as our Chief Financial Officer. It's a little bit of that corporate background in me. Uh, and she does know all the numbers, but uh, we're here both to answer all of your questions. Going to the, to the first slide, um, you know, it's very simple. If we at the Cabinet for Economic Development don't earn the trust and keep the trust of the legislature, of the companies that we work with, those who pay the taxes in this great state, and candidly, all of our existing companies, we will not be successful. And our focus is really pretty simple. We have to be a super collaborator. You'll see in a moment, you know, our staff is fairly small, and that's good because I think being lean is the right way of addressing it. It's about half the size of what it was when I was here about 100 years ago working in the Cabinet for Economic Development back in uh, the, the early 90s. But actually, it's a great team, and I think the size of the team is appropriate for the, the mission and for the things that we do. But ultimately, we have to work very, very closely with all the local elected officials, with uh, state elected officials, with the businesses, with the area development districts. And that's why we've put in here a, a real key is being a super collaborator to work on all facets of what it takes to build great communities. And while it may not be directly under our purview, we find ourselves often working with the communities relative to roads, water, you name it, whatever it takes, we get pulled in and we're happy to do it because those kinds of discussions lead to better understanding and opportunities working with existing new and startup businesses. We focus on building a better Kentucky. There's no question about it. Uh, our focus is on creating well-paying jobs, making sure that we have strong support for our existing companies. And uh, you'll see in a minute, we focus also on those companies that we think are the fastest growing, the best fit, the future of our state, as well as working on startup businesses, technology organizations. And I think the collaboration that we have today with all of our universities in that space is second to none. But in the end, and this is my personal belief, and it is that Everything in economic development is about a shared responsibility. We all need to define what that shared responsibility is if we really truly want to have those shared opportunities that can come from successful community and economic development. That's obviously what we focus on at the cabinet. 
I put this in only because to me it's really important to understand the values and the guidance that we give to all of our team, whether it's individual contributors who lead themselves or whether it's those who are people leaders. But you'll see the key words here, at least for me personally, and that is we have to have a servant mentality. We have to have a real bias for action. And we have to have the kind of straight talk that it takes to create economic opportunity for all residents and not just a few. And in the end, it's about results do matter. And from a values perspective, I, I'm, I'm very uh, proud to say that I think a value is to have a spirit of winning with integrity. Do it the right way, but let's always go about finding ways to win when we have opportunities and uncover whatever the challenges are to make sure that we are able to do so. To me, again, the values of our people is what creates the success in our cabinet. And truly, I think we have a great set of individual professionals and, and people leaders who are making a difference every day. We're structured uh, a little different. Obviously, um, we have a partnership board that we report into. The governor's a member of that, and obviously the governor is the chief executive of the state of Kentucky. And we're divided into departments with the Department for Business Development, our Department for Financial Services, our Office of Entrepreneurship and Small Business Innovation. We've got an Office for Marketing and Public Affairs because branding the state and having the right communications is critically important in attracting and retaining businesses. And we have our Office of Legal Services who also works with uh, the legislature, Angelica, who is right behind us to make sure we say everything the right way, uh, which I'll try to do today. And if you think about it, uh, we also have boards that uh, we comprise, that we manage, and that we work with, whether it's the Kentucky Economic Development Financial Authority, the Bluegrass State Skills Corporation, which we'll talk about here in a moment, and the Commission on Small Business Innovation and Advocacy. We also have two individuals that help staff our international offices, uh, both in Europe and in Asia, and I'll come back and show you some of the metrics associated with those offices and what it is that they do. Look, by all definitions, 2021 was a fantastic year. And by all definitions, the, the Ford SK Blue Oval Project uh, blew it off the hinges in terms of investments and jobs. And I'm going to describe in a little bit why it's not just those direct investments and jobs from that project that matter, but what it really means in terms of where the state is heading, where industries are going, and why we need to be out front in that particular area. But again, in 2021, to have 18,000 new jobs announced and 262 projects some twenty-three, uh, some twenty-three dollars, and almost I'd call it twenty-four dollars in average wages outside of benefits. That's a real key. And we focus on wage growth, and we look at the kinds of wages that we are working toward, either incentivizing an existing company or bringing into uh, the state. And very proud again in uh, 2021, $23.99 an hour is the best that we've seen, except for uh, 2019. And having uh, managed our pilot group at Whirlpool, I can attest to the fact that pilots and the big expansion at UPS helped drive those average wages up in terms of the projects that were announced, which is a good thing. But I think most important, we do view wages and benefits as a really key metric in terms of the, the job that we do at the cabinet. We just uh, also track the industries both by investment and by jobs, and it helps us both uh, understand what we're doing to help our core industries, which are those currently in the state, and some of what I would call strategic companies that we're trying to attract in the area and doing it by those industry segments. And I'll give you a little bit more information shortly. 2022, I think it's been a great year so far, 9,400 jobs announced, about 100 projects, $5.1 billion investment, and that includes the Envision project down in Bowling Green with a $2 billion investment. And to give you some sense, though, of breaking it down, I think uh, the month of July is a really good number. We announced uh, projects uh, $1.1 billion. Uh, there were 13 projects in 11 counties. Of that amount, um, four of them were new companies coming in. The rest were for existing companies. And uh, they were also, I think, uh, representative of uh, the majority in rural communities. And it encompassed all kinds of organizations, whether it was a high-tech company that was funded by the National uh, Science Administration to come in and do recycling for the electronic uh, vehicle industry, or supporting a women-owned business that's been around for some time and helping her expand that business. Our job at the Cabinet is to support all, and I think June is a good example of what it is that we do to try to support existing, new, as well as those targeted ones that are female-owned, diverse-owned uh, individuals, because that's an important part of our values and mission statement as well. 
Everybody knows that, you know, Kentucky happens to be very well located in terms of the automotive industry. I won't go through this, but the fact is we are in the center of a revolution in the automotive sector. And I think it's also critically important for our existing companies for which, uh, you know, one out of every 15 jobs in the entire United States related to the automotive sector is located in Kentucky. And so if you think about what's changing, what's happening out there from a focus on uh, the EV industry versus combustible engines, and I happen to believe there'll be both for quite some time, but the fact is there's a growing area in the EV sector. And with so many of our businesses in Kentucky dependent upon automotive, we need to be the leader in that transformation that's occurring as well. And you can see our job announcements, and we clearly, I think, are that leader, and it helps us, I think, build uh, lots of more opportunities even for our existing companies that exist in Kentucky today. Uh, the, the, the metrics, I think, are important in terms of the automotive sector. I won't go back through them, but when I think of the fact that one out of every $11 in this state is tied to the automotive sector, we can't have a transformation occurring like the EV industry is and not be the leader in that respect. And again, I think the, the Ford SK Blue Oval Project, the Envision Project, and several of the project announcements that are coming to Kentucky to support and supply that sector in the industry is not only really important uh, for our future, but again, I mentioned to you, I think it's important for our existing companies as well. This map to me is really profound. If you think about it, you look at all the international investments that are here in the state of Kentucky. We're fifth nationally in terms of percentage of workers employed by an international company. I'm very proud of that fact because that truly shows us as a global leader, as a great state to do business. And that's one of the reasons that we appreciate your support in allowing us to fund and have representation in Europe and in Asia because even just simply having that presence and being able to work with the headquarter companies that have operations here in the state of Kentucky, that sends a profound statement to them that we care, we value that investment, and we look for more of that to come in the future. These are the top countries, and in 2021, you can see that Germany and Japan kind of were up at the top relative to investments and jobs, and I tie that back again to having a presence in those markets really helps us be able to move quickly be able to build relationships, and be able to build that trust. And I go back to that, build that trust to have uh, companies that are really willing to make the size investments that they make in our state. I, I could talk all day about trends. I really believe economic development is about understanding trends and being out front of what those trends would be. And I've mentioned the EV industry. I'm telling you that speed to market in today, and I know that coming from Whirlpool when we announced projects, competitors, when they hear you're expanding, they start taking actions necessary to try to beat you to the punch in terms of whatever it is you're doing from an expansion mode perspective. Because most expansions are tied to new product platforms, new entries into markets. And so being able to announce a project and as a state deliver on all of the permitting, deliver on the incentives, and delivering on the workforce training so a company can be operational when they've told their shareholders or their stakeholders that they will be operational is critically important. And I believe as an economic developer, we have to lead with that and we have to be able to show how good we are as a state in terms of delivering on our commitments, but doing it quickly so that they can gain that competitive advantage or better yet, not be disadvantaged because of our slow response to their respective and specific needs. We all know that in today's world, uh, workforce, workforce capacity, so it's people and communities that are now driving a lot of the decisions being made by companies because People and the workforce are what's going to drive success for a company, which is one of the reasons that we think it's a trend and we have to work very closely uh, with the other cabinets to be out front of that change that's occurring. And it's happening in every state and every country. So let's make sure Kentucky's out front on some of the initiatives to show that we can do that better than those other states. Renewables are also a really critical factor. And um, I know that, again, in my private sector days, when Blackstone came out and started talking about investors are looking directly at uh, the ESG reports of publicly traded companies in terms of where they will invest, the environment, commitment to society, and the governance is critically important. And I think there's a role economic development plays in helping companies realize how we can support them in that particular area. And I'm convinced that a lot of these big companies are going to push down those same requirements on their suppliers, for which we have many in the state of Kentucky. We have to be prepared to help them in those respective areas as well. Uh, we've also know that, like anything, you got to have product if you're going to sell something. And the uh, the uh, 
prototypes and the piloting work that was done. I think uh, a great success of that is Henderson. And I just wanted to personally come in and thank the legislature for your support, your leadership in creating uh, through House Bill 745, the $100 million product development initiative. And we've had great response. We're hearing a lot of great interest as well as some regional collaboration on those projects and getting those dollars out the door, getting those products in the ground. And it's not just about a piece of dirt. It's really showing how that site and the types of support they can get from the community. That creates the products that allows us to go out and offer up to existing companies as well as new companies what it is they need to grow and expand, and we thank you all for that, for that support. I won't go through all these, but being a super collaborator means tell us what we need to do. It means being servant and understanding who we work for. We work for the legislature. We work for others. Our job at the Cabinet is to be a problem solver, and um, some of the team have already heard me. I believe that Yabbit season ought to be open year-round because any time I hear yeah but from anybody, I'd say we're not doing our job as an economic developer. Our job is to figure out how to solve a problem and go find the people that can help do that. And I'm very proud of the fact that we get called in to do a lot of problem solving for a lot of existing companies, new companies, and startups that we don't even have to go to our toolbox. It's simply helping them understand where that support currently exists throughout the state of Kentucky. One of the really important processes that I think is now underway in the state is the fact that we have multiple hubs uh, that deal with companies, high-tech companies, startup companies, and those hubs are really at the ground level and create collaboration at the ground level at a regional level as well in terms of who best can support high-tech startups and, and those sorts of things in the state. And this process of having that collaborative works very, very well through our Cabinet for Economic Development. We also have growing relationships with the university. And I say growing because I still believe the opportunities are yet fully realized in terms of the technology, the kinds of problem solving, and in many cases intellectual property that can come through universities that can be commercialized in the direct creation of jobs. And so whether it's the hub for engineering, whether it's the biomedical innovation centers that we're working on, lots of opportunities are out there in working with our universities to find new kinds of industry, help existing companies be on the cutting edge of what's happening and changing tomorrow, and in some cases, commercializing great ideas that can be fostered through the university process. Incentives, um, tell you right up front, I'm not a big fan of incentives, but I'm also a realist. And in today's world, and having done projects all over the world with Whirlpool Corporation, it's not just the 50 states that are competitive. It's every country, everywhere around the world. And incentives are the tools that you have to have to basically be in the game. Now, I believe very strongly the smart use of incentives, really understanding the needs of the company, and as I like to say, providing one penny more than what uh, they're getting somewhere else is what you need to do, but never give any more than one penny more in order to get the transaction. It's difficult. It's a bit of the art. But I think understanding that this is truly a, a global issue and global's uh, perspective in terms of how companies today are looking where to make locations, and that includes where to expand. And I can tell you again from my private sector, uh, efforts when you look at making a decision to take capital to do capital investment in facilities and equipment in an existing facility, you almost start from ground one and say, should we do it there or should we go find a greenfield location? So I always put the use of incentives are just equally as important in having that toolbox for existing companies as well as new ones. There's a lot of programs, um, and I can't go through all the anacronyms. I won't, but I'll go to the real next one, which is everything is performance-based. And I think it makes Kentucky unique in that we say to companies, you're going to be given valued, good incentives, but you have to perform. I know from experience there are some states and some communities that provide a lot of upfront cash without a lot of tiebacks to it. That goes back to the shared responsibility. And I feel very good about the fact that whether it's our CAD for loans and grants, the high-tech work, our, our KBI programs, everything's really tied to the company earning it by virtue of having put Dirt, you know, taking a piece of dirt, building a building, renovating a building, buying the equipment, and employing people, then they get the value of those incentives that we can offer them. That's what we mean by performance-based incentives. Workforce um, is critical. The Bluegrass State Skills Corporation provides 
funding to support companies, su surprise, provides funding to support existing businesses. And I think even in the month of July, 90% of all the companies that received Bluegrass State Skills Corporation support were existing companies. And that included rural hospitals and rural health care providers that needed the training in order to be able to provide the kind of services necessary for the people of Kentucky. And this is my favorite one, um, shared responsibility. We have an obligation to this cabinet and to the taxpayers that if we enter into a program or an agreement with a company, that we also have the follow-up compliance steps necessary to make sure that company is fulfilling their obligations as we are fulfilling ours to them. And we have some uh, 1,200 projects that are currently in the monitoring status. I think about 17% of our total staff is really geared toward 100% of the compliance. Compliance matters, and we're glad to do it, and we're very proud of the results that we have as a result. And that includes monitoring the wages that are being paid, that we're told that would be the case by the company, monitoring the level of investment, monitoring even their own compliance with the permits that were approved from a regulatory perspective. We have lots of, of ways in which we deal with making sure companies are doing what it was they said they were going to do. And this is the area which I'm happy to get into, uh, but I will share with you, as you all know better than anyone, our cabinet serves sometimes as a conduit, which we're great and happy to do. And there's uh, last year there was some line items in our budget. This year there's really some fantastic line items in our project base that we're administering. And so there's a, I always like to look at a budget. What is our steady state budget rate? What are those that are special, unique to come and flow through our cabinet? And candidly, at the end of the day, uh, that gives you a better sense of where our budgets go and which ones are reoccurring and which ones are not. And in the end, also, our, our people are our biggest cost relative to the operating side of the budget. And I think we do a very good job because historically, uh, we come in under budget. And that is a real mantra of both Katie and myself that uh, we, we must come in under or no, definitely not go over budgets because that's back to earning and keeping the trust that we have with this legislature. Here, do you want to go back to that one? Take okay, you go back and walk them through the specific <laughs> numbers. Okay. Because I think that's what they'd like to hear. <clears throat> so for last year, this slide shows you the actual expenditures that were incurred for last year for the cabinet. Our recurring expenditures are typically our personnel operating and our grants. That includes our workforce grants as well as some of the hubs and the uh, KY innovation entrepreneurship work that the secretary was previously discussing. So in total, uh, personnel, we had $10.8 million of expenditures. Operations, we had $1.7 million. Uh, the grants, we had just shy of $13 million. And then we had debt service of $3.3 million. Uh, for a total of $28.8 I think we came in roughly around $1.5 million under budget. Uh, the non-recurring grants from last year were over $30 million. $20 million of that is the funding for the Rural Hospital Loan Program. Thank you all for that. And then the uh, $10.6 million was to pay off the loan related to the property for the Glen at the Glendale site. <coughs> And then when we get into our budget for the current fiscal year, again, the recurring items are our personnel costs are 14 million, operations of 1.8, and our workforce and our entrepreneurship grants are $15 million. Uh, the non-recurring grants are very large, over $280 million, and those are uh, funds for the Kentucky Product Development Initiative that you all authorized in the budget for us. Thank you for that as well as several line item projects uh, in different areas and communities across Kentucky that we will be administering uh, this year. Uh, you will see the budget includes $301,000 of federal funding. Uh, that is related to our STEP program, our state trade expansion program, as well as our prior state small business credit initiative that we applied to the federal government in 2011 and we were authorized a little over $15 million. Just to keep you updated, we have submitted an application for what they're calling SSBCI 2.0, and we envision uh, being authorized potentially over $100 million to be able to use. Uh, the, the most successful program from the prior uh, SSBCI was our collateral support program. We'll be using that tool as well as our loan participation program, and we are now going to also create a venture capital program under that as well. So we hope to be increasing the federal funding once we hear from the federal government if we've been approved those funds. And I might point out the amount of questions the federal government has asked <laughs> relative to our past performance. Uh, it's amazing. 
they've also been very candid in that the collaboration that we have with our universities, the really strong work we have with our local hubs, and with the records that we keep and the way in which we've been able to answer their very specific questions based on past performance have really helped us, and that's one of the reasons that we're optimistic we're going to be able to get such a sizable grant award. <clears throat> and those awards also are going to be, some of them have to be, or, or certain portion have to be used for, um, what's the, uh, it's SETI, I can't remember, but it, it more economically distressed, socially economically distressed communities. And we've already been keeping a little bit of track of that as of what percentage have been in uh, the SOAR and Promise Zones and things. And so that has also been very helpful with the federal government. And uh, two of our projects in two different annual reports previously were highlighted uh, because of the success and they were, I believe, in those SOAR communities. So. And then this slide <clears throat> goes through our personnel. We are, you know, we are hiring. We are trying to get up. Our personal cap is 85. We're at 64. Um, because of the, the wonderful work that the staff does and the relationships that we get and we develop with these companies, uh, they're very attractive to the companies once they locate here. And sometimes our staff are stolen. Um, so, but. The thing we're very pleased is we were able to help them uh, grow in their careers and they get these wonderful opportunities. So we're happy for those that have been able to move on to uh, bigger and better opportunities, but we are hiring and we do have, a, as you mentioned, Secretary, we do have a lean staff, very hardworking, lots of programs, lots of projects, and but we, we pride ourselves on our customer service. And we celebrate, as Katie mentioned, the staff that find great opportunities because my, my view is to be branded as an as a organization that if you come to work and you do really good work and you do hard work, but you do it with the right attitude, opportunities are out there for you. And to kind of give you some peace of mind, I'm very pre pleased with some of the, the new hires that we've had in the last several months, especially in the project management area. We have an individual that just passed the bar. We have a young gentleman who spent quite a few years in the military and actually got certificates in uh, project management. Uh, we have an individual that comes from a very good marketing and good uh, communications background. And so when I look at the project management team, they all bring unique skill sets, and I think that's really a good thing. And the best thing that they bring, even though they happen to be young, um, is a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and a desire to learn. And we have several what I would call grizzled leaders within the organization, and we have a fantastic uh, leader in uh, Christina Slattery, who I believe we have a, when you think of it, we have the right m composite and the right mix as a team. And to me, that's a, a great uh, sign of future successes to come. And we're so proud of our team that we can fit them all on one slide. So, <laughs> and uh, that's all we have. Happy to entertain any questions you may have. All right. Well, thank you all for the presentation. And this is something that we all get excited about anytime we see our economy growing and, and anytime we see that um, folks can go earn a living, send their kids to school, come home, buy a house, and, and live the American dream is an exciting thing. And so I'd say we're going to have several questions and comments. I'm going to start with Senator McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome aboard. Thank you very it's much. Good to see you today. A um, couple things mainly centered around uh, – batteries and lithium and such um first of all um when we were briefed on the bowling green project and obviously this was prior to your time um and obviously in that sector right now there's almost no way to get going without a substantial amount of chinese involvement um but we were, what we were briefed is that there was a, a an exit strategy for divesting of the chinese involvement affiliated with that um, are, is that still the intent of that organization, or do you know anything about that at this point? I cannot say that I have intimate details to that at all, and I don't really want to start to speculate what that might be. Please don't. Take your time. We Take a week or an, so. This is a long-term we'll an deal. Answer. Um, what I do know, obviously, is um, given the technology, there are a large number of Chinese companies actively engaged but also with the sensitivities. I just know that we do an awful lot of due diligence, including background checks, including working with federal agencies to understand who's involved in, in the relationship or who's involved in the company. And I think that's a very important step that we take on. But as it relates to a strategy to divest, let us get back to you with that in writing. And, and I appreciate the question, Senator. Please do. And understand some of us are kind of uh, uh, 
very sensitive. We, you know, we had, we had been asked to approve some of these Confucius Institutes uh, years ago that, that yes, were were built far differently than executed, and and so there, we just maintain a sensitivity to, um, particularly the, the mo of, of the Chinese government and yeah. and some things that have gone on with good reason. And so, therefore, I actually appreciate the question, and hope you'll and this whole body will continue to ask questions relative to that. And I'm just trying to be very careful not to say anything that I, I'm not sure about. I just know that. I share your sensitivity, uh, and it's one of the reasons we've created a process that we do a lot of due diligence, a lot of checks, and a lot of understanding, and having actually done some business in China, um, the concern is very validated and should be, and yet there are some really unique entrepreneurs who have built fantastic companies coming out of China that if they check out the way they should uh, are the kinds of companies with some really unique specialties that can help our state, and we want to make sure that we work with them if they meet all the right criteria. Understood. And, and two more, Mr. Chairman, please. Um, secondly, I've been reading about some not insignificant challenges with the uh, lithium refining operations down in uh, Central and South America. Um, obviously, as this industry ramps up and it's not clearly on an exponential curve, um, what insulation or, or um, provision do we as the Commonwealth have for any hiccups that occur along the line? Because obviously, without the lithium, there is no batteries, and, and, that, and that's a long chain from mm -hmm. extraction to converting it into actual usable elements. I'm going to make an assumption in terms of some of the, the questions so that I can answer it the right way. But, you know, from my perspective, one, it's one of the reasons that our, our – Incentives are performance-based. So we have some ability to control, or should I say, make sure that we don't get hung out to dry if there is not the ability for the company to invest in, and to make the investment and to employ the people of Kentucky, because a lot of those benefits are tied back to that employment. On the flip side, as it relates to uh, the benefits that were afforded those projects, especially with the work of the legislature, there is the right kind of criteria relative to the agreements on those loans, the kind of collateralization that needs to take place on those loans to help give us every assurance that the companies will pay back those loans in the unlikely event, whatever were to occur. So therefore, we've tried to build in both, A, the benefits they get are tied to employment, creating uh, the investments that need to be done, and having the capacity to pay back those loans in the unlikely event something were to occur. But Katie, did I address that correctly? Covered it correctly, yes. And, and lastly, it, at, at the fear of commenting to someone who's an expert in uh, very complex supply chains. Um, I wish we were. <laughs> I'm just teasing with you. Um, there's a lot that goes on between extraction and through the refinement to where we can yeah. manufacture the batteries at the two locations that will actually be in the Commonwealth. And with the... Um, rail and water facilities that we still have in the east um i would really hope that we would put some some effort into those intermediate steps in in converting the raw product into a, a usable form and particularly focus in those areas because as, as you know there's more than you know the unemployment rate and the workforce participation reflects the fact that there is a ready supply of workforce there um, it's just what jobs can we bring at scale to those regions, and I, you know, I hope that we look hard at those other steps because it, the companies simply don't exist right now at, at scale to do what they need to do, and, and I think it's a good opportunity for us. There's no question trying to find opportunities for all 120 counties, mm -hmm. also trying to find opportunities for those parts of the state that have higher levels of either unemployment or lack of participation rate. That's a real key priority, and to your point, there's also, I think, some natural infrastructure and some historical industries that used to be in some parts of our state that don't mirror up directly, but the fundamentals of what it takes to convert, manufacture, and, and ship uh, have taken place there. And so we are trying to work on all those areas, and my hope is that with the $100 million, uh, 745 that you all provided, we're going to be able to get more product to be able to then connect both the product the workforce and the intent of the state to try to get them throughout all parts of Kentucky. 
Thank you very much, Secretary. Katie obviously knows how to get a hold of me anytime, so please uh, never hesitate to call. Well, and Senator, we appreciate, and all of you, we appreciate your ongoing um, working with us and, and the questions that you ask. I believe very strongly that the give and take and the communications with the legislature and individual members is a critical part of what we do. And so I appreciate that very much and look forward to continuing uh, to have that opportunity to work with you and with everyone else on this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, Representative Weber has a question or a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, first of all, Secretary Knoll, thank you uh, for coming today. Welcome to Kentucky. Katie, it's always good to see you. Welcome back to Kentucky. I always Welcome want to be back clear. To I, I, yeah. I grew up here and spent a lot of time here. Yeah, very good. Very good. Um, first question uh, that I have for you. Uh, as a And first of all, I'm glad that, that you're, you're filling the role. You're in the role as the permanent cabinet secretary. I think that that's important for the economic development cabinet, and I, and I appreciate you being in that role. As you've come in uh, and you're looking at the cabinet, uh, what are some areas that you've identified that we need to, to change the way we do business in the state? Uh, you know, we have a lot of companies uh, in, in the West, particularly California, if I remember reading, that are opting to leave that state and move to Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma, and those states are very aggressive uh, in recruiting those companies. Um, I'm assuming if a company's willing to leave California and move to Oklahoma, they could move a little further east and, and make Kentucky their home. So what are some areas you've identified that, that we either need to change, uh, things we're not doing that we need to do, things that we're doing that we need not to do? Um, to bring industry here, to bring these jobs here to our state and across? First, I'm going to go back to, to, to the most important and most relevant for uh, bringing industries and companies here, and, and that is, without a doubt, and everybody's experiencing it, we've got to find ways of enhancing and improving the, the way in which workforce is identified, the way in which workforce is trained, and I actually believe we have all the tools to train individuals to meet the jobs that are, I think Secretary Fink does an outstanding job. But ultimately, it's, it's back a little bit to the supply and demand. And I feel like the real opportunity is not only to look at the existing workforce, but as I believe is really occurring throughout the state, is to find ways in which we're helping young people understand where these opportunities are, why they exist, and what they can do to take advantage of them. And, and back to the, the, the electronic vehicle and some of the companies that we've announced since, they're paying really good wages. They have an environment that's really cool, if I may say that. And also, as we were doing with, with Whirlpool, you know, robotics are coming in not to replace jobs, but change what the jobs are. And I think the more we have that, the more we can encourage young people to take advantage of those employment opportunities. Now, it's not so much public policy because I'm not here to recommend policy changes. Um, but I do think that there can be ways in which we might look at either some incentives or the way we use our incentives to fill gaps or to work more closely with private industry and even the Kentucky Housing Corporation and finding ways that we can stimulate some housing development that maybe fits a broader spectrum of, of the earnings range so that we make sure that as we have these jobs and these opportunities, we can actually attract folks into those areas. And I think there's some ways in which you can incentivize companies to perhaps do more in that space. I don't know if it would be at the scale initially, but I think if we had the right tools, we could encourage companies to come in and make housing and um, different kinds of spectrum of housing one of the things they do as well as investing in the plant and equipment and training, et cetera. Um, I, I'm not ready yet to offer policy relative to taxation and things like that because I think one of the things Kentucky does really, really well is we're very aggressive in working with companies I think we have a great brand. I know that I was vice chairman of the Michigan Economic Development Corporation for the last 14 years or something like that uh, across three governors. And uh, the staff there always wanted to pick my brain because they always want to know how great and how good Kentucky was in terms of what they do from an economic development perspective. And we do and we are. Uh, and so I think I, I feel like we do that really, really well. I'm just not ready to get into all of the you know, driving down on how a company looks at Kentucky because I haven't been back in the state long enough to be able to dissect that and to break it down because sometimes it's depending on how the company's structured. Sometimes it's depending on if it's a joint venture, if it's an LLC. There's lots of things that go into 
how the company's impacted. And I want to be an expert of that before I make too much, too many comments. The one other area that I think we've got tremendous opportunities on is these regional hubs and really looking at collaborating with universities and others around technology. Um, and there's just, in my humble opinion, more companies are going to be commercialized or should I say started and then the commercialization of good ideas to create the kinds of jobs for the future. And last but not least, I'm absolutely convinced that we can find and, and we need to be even more aggressive in finding smaller companies. And I think that we've got some areas across the state that would be easier to place a 100 or 200 operation. And in some cases, we may have to have a disproportionate level of tools to help support that in those areas, because I think there's some opportunities in that space, especially as I look at what's being done relative to supply chain constraints and companies having to re, um, reimagine how they're doing and also some smaller companies that might come here to get started in terms of how they are responding to a need for a change in the supply chain. And, and that's a long one to simply saying, I, I think we just have to look at the space and can we do more for smaller companies in different parts of the state? Mm -hmm. Can I have a follow-up, Mr. Chair? Uh, well, so I guess it's not technically a follow-up. Uh, so uh, another area I wanted to, to ask you about is uh, the Blue Oval Corporation, in, uh, that's coming to Glendale. Um, that's an area that's very close to, to where uh, I represent. I do have the northern part of mm -hmm. Hardin County. So what are we looking at in terms of, of satellite companies? You know, there'll they'll always be support uh, entities like we see with, with Toyota and Georgetown. So what kind of interest are we hearing from folks about the area for satellite corporations because I've heard that as far west as say uh, Hopkinsville there are companies that are talking about locating there uh, you know in the close proximity to the to our interstate mm -hmm. system so you may not be able to give us a lot of specifics but what kind of feel are we getting right now for for satellite operations that may be interested in the area and because that that will also be another workforce uh, challenge uh, in addition to the 5,000 that uh, that Blue Oval will need uh, with the issue that we're already facing uh, so in gonna, the state. I'll break it down maybe this way, and then Katie can chime in. You know, first of all, I think as the JV is being finalized and SK Ford really coming together to, to operate as an entity together, and having been involved in that, sometimes it takes a little longer than you might think for JVs to really get operational. Um, so the longer that... Ford SK continue to work together and doing what they're doing, I think that the satellite and the supplier is only going to grow. But what's really encouraging is the amount of activity we currently have. I mean, the Ascend announcement yes. uh, in Hopkinsville is a perfect example, and that's a company that I think they were started actually technically in 2015, but, but they've been beneficiaries of perfecting and showing their um, intellectual property of recycling lithium batteries to, through an NSA juried process. And they've been doing a pilot down in Georgia. Now they're coming here with their major investments. Uh, so we, we've got several uh, of those projects that we've announced, but more importantly, we've got a lot in the hopper where companies are coming in. And they're very candid also saying, you know, we're here because of where you're located and where you're located relative to all of the electronic vehicles that have been uh, announced processes and, and manufacturing locations. And then we have some that are here because um, either SK or Ford have said, you need to get ready. We're going to be calling upon you to, to be here to supply and support us. And that goes back to your comment about workforce, it goes back to housing, goes back to all the things that I think that we have. And it won't happen all overnight, but there's no question that we're going to get more than our fair share of the satellite and supplier operations that, that are going to come in to support those industries. And at some point, we have to figure out, are there tools that we might use to even help our existing companies be able to connect with those operations for a potential supplier relationship, whatever that might be? And perhaps there's some tools that we can do relative to automating, you know, procurement connections or things like that, or we can offer it through, through the cabinet. We're looking into those things. Um, Long-winded answer to your question, Representative, that we're going to get more than our fair share, and the activity already is uh, very encouraging. And I think it's only going to continue to grow, especially as we make announcements and we get the reputation for doing what it is that we say we're going to do. And for both um, the project in Bowling Green and in Hardin County, um, 
we know for a fact that, and I give Secretary Good a lot of credit, we've, we've been tremendously fast, but yet thorough and fully um, engaged in all the uh, permits necessary to become operational. And I think that uh, the weekly calls that we do to make sure we're delivering on all the commitments and the engagement at the local regional level relative to workforce training, community colleges, I think the companies are saying that we do it better than they've seen in other states. And that's the best way of getting other companies to locate here. Thank you. Uh, Representative Gentry, if you want to make some comments or questions, we got about five minutes left and we're going to have to close down. I think there's another meeting behind us. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll, I'll be brief. Um, first of all, welcome back. Thank you, sir. <laughs> and uh, good seeing you again, Katie. Um, as you know, for several years, we've been dealing with the decline of the coal industry. And um, there's been some legislation passed recently in Washington, uh, yesterday, and in, in semiconductor legislation recently. And are you how familiar familiar are you with that legislation and do you care to to comment on impacts for the future in kentucky from any of that legislation that might be coming i'm not an expert in the the ways that the legislation can actually direct the bottom line for some of these companies but i'm knowledgeable enough to know that there's pretty significant dollars coming in from the federal government that are going to help across the state I mean, excuse me, across the nation. Um, even at Whirlpool, you know, the supply of uh, chips and primarily the wafers, and there's actually two different kinds of the, you know, the chips relative to what are traditionally used, what are some of the new ones, and different kinds of debates are out there about which one is really the most in need and which ones are going to be built. Um, but um, I'm just going to go back to Kentucky's aggressive in everything we do. Uh, we've been responsive in terms of trying to encourage and connect the dots to where those opportunities are going to present themselves. And we know, I think we have a really good reputation with the Department of Energy and some of the other federal levels where the funding can come from and where the support's going to come from, that when we have those real opportunities, we're going to be very, very competitive. But I can't, and, I, and I'm just not in a position to try and predict and say which way these things are going to go. There's a lot of dynamics that are going into the final decisions being made about which locations, what's needed in a location. Um, and we, we have a team that's been working on it. We have a team that's been uh, identifying it. And we've had communications with potential opportunities in that space. I'm going to conclude just a, a short comment. Uh, Secretary and Commissioner, I really appreciate your presentation. And it's refreshing to hear somebody from the private sector uh, representing the cabinet and bringing the wealth of knowledge that you do. We all know in the world you have politics and bureaucrats and in the private sector and so it uh, it's it's good to kind of mix it all up and have all the different perspectives and you know i have three and a half uh, months left to serve in this position i'm retiring and going back to the private sector uh, i was fortunate to live the american dream and it's it's refreshing to see what's going on in kentucky and seeing the energy that's building around our state from east to west and the amount of be people from all around the world that are looking to locate here. And as that energy builds, it's just going to compound on itself. And one of the things that as a businessman that we're starting to really notice is, I guess I can say this for another three and a half months, I guess I'm one of the youngest serving senators in the General Assembly, so I relate to the younger crowd a little bit. But there's, a, there's an entrepreneurial spirit growing amongst people my age and even younger in this state. And one of the things... Uh, Starting at 19 in my garage, I remember when I applied for my very first KBI. And um, one of the things that I would like to recommend that we look at is, is those stipulations. We base it all around the number of jobs and revenue invested. And a lot of times our local offices, not out of uh, necessarily uh, ill intent, but they'll convince you to put more jobs on there than probably that's physically possible starting off as a young entrepreneur. So I think we need to look at those programs and make it more achievable for our young entrepreneurs because I think there's a world of opportunity of growth, especially when we talk about accountability, a drive, you know, the, how fast we can get to market to help subsidize some of these micro uh, companies that are coming in here. We can help it from a micro level. So just a little bit of advice from somebody who's lived it. So, uh, Senator, we agree. That's one of the reasons I mentioned to Representative Weber. I think we have to find ways that we can incentivize and work with smaller companies and or, to your point, those startup 
And I see a much longer benefit from it as well. If we can be branded as a state that's really supporting the entrepreneurship that's out there and that we're willing to, to help support those kinds of entrepreneurs, you know, we're going to brand the state where a lot of our young people are going through our colleges or going through technical schools who are thinking, I want to go into business for myself. They will then choose to stay here as opposed to some who might choose to leave. And I think there's a, there's a lot of benefits in being known as a state that has tools as well as a, a technical understanding of how to work with entrepreneurs every step along the way to help them achieve their dream. Well, absolutely. Well, we're out of time. So this concludes the second meeting. Uh, do we have a motion for adjournment? Oh. The next, I'm sorry, I get straightened out up here. Our next meeting will be on September 21st, uh, and will be chaired by um, Beckler, Representative Beckler, and 